Thank you. A bit of a change of tact after some, uh, yeah, very high-level technology talks. It's fantastic to see the positive messages coming out of some of that technology that's so close to having paddock uh, application. Well, we often go to some conferences and hear this stuff at it's very high level and you sort of wonder if it's ever going to get to a paddock level. But like Kiralee said, to be at Beefwood last year and actually see that boom with the camera in the paddock, uh, it, yeah, it was, it was pretty impressive. So it's, it's a lot closer than what we think. And if uh, that, that 225,000, uh, 100,000 that he mentioned, you, you can sort of add up, um, if you're back to 5 to 10% of broadleaf spraying in, in cereal crops, for, for example, and if you've got any sort of scale, uh, the, the numbers are going to be um, yeah, achievable. Anyway, uh, what I'm meant to be talking about, I strip and dis. So I'm just going to take a step back in terms of a farming system perspective. And some people have heard this talk before, but just to, uh, we, we've got a, a group of growers in our part of the world that have sort of taken a lot of the principles of the big six and then applied them to uh, a high residue style of farming. So the, the Wimmer is where we are today is renowned for its high residue um, I guess farming systems, particularly with the high proportion of legumes, pulses. Uh, we're sort of doing that at a, a similar level in southern New South Wales, but we're also incorporating things like harvest weed seed control, narrow rows. So uh, it's not sort of meant to be something that you should adopt directly, but just to, to put in the context of, of some of the challenges, and you go all the way back to Tim, who was the first speaker this morning, about some of the, the difficulties yet that people are facing with some of these weed control options. Well, we've actually got some really powerful non-chemical tools that, are, uh, that have got good adoption. So we'll, we'll just sort of step through that. Uh, yeah, it's called Stacking the Big Six. So it starts off with a, a video. So um, Kiralee put this together a couple of years ago with a bit of groovy music. It's a harvest process, harvesting high with a Shelbourne stripper front. High, high levels of residue. And then back through that residue with a dish seeder. So that puts it in perspective. Uh, I guess initially for those that haven't been exposed to it, what, what is strip and disc? As I said, it initially is a use of a, a Shelbourne stripper, which I'll go into a little bit more detail. So that's a header front built in Suffolk in the UK, which has had adaption in, in rice, but now it's being used more and more in dryland scenarios, particularly in the US. So the idea is to harvest high, leave um, lots of residue behind. Uh, it, it does amazing things for harvest capacity as well, which I'll talk a little bit about. And then you come back and sow with a disc seeder on narrow rows. And I'll talk about the narrow rows. So we, we've heard, and everyone's known in the whole no-till revolution, the, uh, the importance of pre-emergent herbicides with knife points and press wheels. Well, the, the, the pre-emergent story and, and, and efficacy if uh, applying the bare soil just doesn't work in this system. So we have to do other, other tactics and hence the use of, of narrow rows. So for us in southern New South Wales, um, we aim to sow up to 60% of our crop in, in April, and April, as BOM records tell us, is our, is our driest month. So we really want to use some um, a, a tools that allow us to, to get crop in, have stored soil moisture, uh, and, and as everyone's calendar sowing, um, be confident with the, with the practices around that. And a key thing, and that's why it's written in red, is uh, it's been a really strong theme today, is diverse rotations and, and harvest weed seed control. So without those things, we've all done a bit of disseeding seeding in the past. It's tended to fall over because of resistant weeds. Well, we've sort of developed a bit of a package that we, we think is pretty robust. So it starts uh, with the big six, diverse rotations. So when you go home tonight, you'll, you'll have all six of these in your head. You, you'll know them off by heart. Uh, the double knock, which Pete talked about, mix and rotate, crop competition, stop seed set and harvest weed seed control. So, but we, we want to get some gold stars uh, and the key things with the strip and disc that really stand out uh, to make it work is the, uh, the diverse rotations, the crop competition and, and the harvest weed seed control. So w without those in place and it, if one's not done well, the, the legs tend to fall off the whole program for a whole range of reasons and we'll explain that in some detail. So why strip and disc? I guess as with all the things we've learned today and, and the panel that had the harvest weed seed control session really rammed home to me and Sam, Tim speaking as well, farmers are, are great innovators and, and we're just fortunate to work with a group of farmers that sort of wanted to look at doing things a little bit different. We spent a lot of time digging soil pits so whilst this is a weed, uh, a weed management uh, forum, um, I, I guess farming systems and, and soils are, are just the basis of what we do. So. 
a part of that is uh, developing more resilient systems. So everyone whinges about the weather and, and all the, uh, I guess, the pressures that the weather brings. Well, there's a group of growers out there sort of, and, and people in this area doing the same thing, trying to farm in the face of the adversity of the weather that throws up to them. So these are some of the tools they've developed. They're, they're cropping dominant operations. Um, some now have, have sheep back in the system, but largely continuous croppers developed it. Um, they were just finding that higher spend on inputs, such as fungicides, um, I, I guess new pre-emergent herbicides, which I talked about, it, it actually wasn't delivering them more profits, at the, especially in the face of some of these, um, I guess, adverse climate uh, situations. And some of them weren't really satisfied with it as well. They weren't sort of, I guess, getting uh, personal satisfaction out of it as well as profits, but that's, a, that's, that's their uh, interpretation. They really wanted some more resilient farming systems. So I guess they wanted to gain control despite the, the, the fact that we get hit with dry seasons or we have frosty seasons. So I guess we've heard Rick talked about Twitter today, and Twitter's a great thing, but you just see this cop out on Twitter a lot of the times that, oh, when are we going to get a normal season? Well, there is no normal season. So farming, we, we operate in, in some pretty difficult, and Australia, it's interesting here with the investment in Australia, innovation, because it's, uh, yeah, it, it's a tough climate to work in. So these, these growers are sort of trying to develop farming systems that, that sort of help build that resilience. So they're wanting to be more efficient with moisture. So we're in, in facing our third year of Decile 1 growing season rainfall in southern New South Wales. So that, that's real for us. So um, it's a little bit different in the wind with the, the rainfall you've had here, but you're sort of given a northern Mallee, other parts, of the, other parts of South Australia. So the moisture, moisture is a big driver of a lot of our decisions. Uh, and that, that moisture is oh, the in crop or in fallow as well. So it's, it's something we want to get more efficient with. We want to reduce our herbicide resistance. So we've seen a lot of pressure with things like Group A, Group B. Um, but as new herbicide groups are coming along, we seem to not being not not getting ahead of, of the curve, so to speak. So we're still under a lot of pressure, and we wanted lower weed numbers, and we just wanted to lessen the risk. So for a lot of them, it's actually trying to achieve high profits, not high yields, um, which is uh, yeah done at, at a business level, and it sort of flows on from what Rick was talking about. It, it, crop diversity has been the tool with which they've been able to achieve it. So for us, we, we were sort of in some really intense canola wheat rotations. Um, and, and sort of the, the wheels have come off after about a decade for a whole lot of reasons. So in terms of high, high uses of synthetic N, uh, burning all their cereal stubbles, and ryegrass particularly has adapted really well to that simple system. So a bit like Pete's example of wheat lupins in WA. So here's a photograph I took in uh, April this year in southern New South Wales. So we did a property inspection with, with a, uh, some clients looking to buy some land. Um, yeah, that's... I don't know, we sort of think about all the soil conservation tactics and, and no-till farming, but still we're, we're sort of, after a couple of dry springs, our landscape is in, it's in a pretty bad way in our part of the world, particularly into central New South Wales. So we've come so far and yet we have a couple of bad seasons and the wheels just seem to fall off so much quicker in some systems compared to others. So um, those clients have purchased that farm, they will turn it around, but it's, uh, it's a long road to hoe compared to, to uh, other areas. And it's just been topsoil loss from, from wind and water. And it's interesting, the water one really, I think, gets to me more than most, because it seems to be in our region, the people that whinge about having the least amount of rainfall are the same ones that aren't keeping their, their soil covered uh, through things like containment areas. Um, and then when it does rain, a lot of that actually runs off. So it's, it's sort of a yeah, vicious cycle. So wind, wind and water, just, it's really important to, to be able to manage the, uh, the topsoil. So really, this is just uh, stuff that, that um, yeah, it's an evolution of a system. Stubble retention, it's, it's been around for a long time. You look at summer fallow and pre-emergent herbicides, they're, they're really proven tactics. Early sowing for us uh, has been a powerful tool. So we're sowing early, but not exposing ourselves to more frost. Uh, James Hunt has been a great proponent of some of that work, um, so getting the phenology right. And then double break rotation, so that it comes back to even some of our tours down to the Wimmera um, you know, 10, 15 years ago where we first saw things like faba beans and canola grown in sequence, and we'd never really thought to do that. So that ability to really hit those grass weeds hard. Um, so that, that, that's sort of um, got us to a point. But then we've sort of wanted to go the, the next step, and that's where disseeding seeding has come in. So we are fortunate enough to work with a group of farmers who want to use disseeders, seeders, which I know is not everyone's cup of tea, but um, they, they're working for us, and I'll talk a little bit about that. CTF is a given. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's sort of the adoption of CTF has sort of become mainstream now, but even 10 years ago it was sort of frowned upon as something that was a bit, a bit marginal, but it's, it's sort of a pillar as machines get heavier. 
Narrow row spacing, again, it's a bit controversial, but for us it's been a necessary tool to help um, mitigate things like ryegrass and, and brome grass uh, escapes. Crop topping and harvest weed seed control. So it's just another part of this big six of these tactics that we all throw in to really um, yeah, help the system have success in the face of uh, difficult seasons. And then the last one is the stripper front. So whilst I'm talking about stripper, strip and disc, just put in perspective of all the other things at, at, at your own farm or in our system that we've ticked off first before we've got to the stripper front. So if, if someone's sort of looking at some of this strip and disc, strip and disc system, think it's interesting, I, I would encourage you to buy the stripper front last. There's so many other things to get right. Even the disc seeder could come second last there. There's so many other aspects to, to getting these systems right before, uh, before you get to that level. So for us, it's been uh, disc seeding. We've, we've really um, yeah, worked, worked with a lot of growers and they've come to us and sort of wanted to improve on how the disc seeding um, can, I guess, mitigate some of that moisture stress that we see at sowing, but also keep more residue. Um, zero till, retain moisture at sowing. So we, we want to have the confidence to be able to sow in April, particularly then into early May, um, whether it's rained or not. So for us, there's often uh, water vapour in the soil. Whilst we think we're dry sowing, we seem to be getting more and more of these crops up year in, year out. And we're calendar sowing. So we want to sow early or sow timely, uh, and even in the face, to, the face of frost risk and, and heat stress at the back end of the season, which um, has been a really good message through GRDC programs in recent years. In our soils, which are largely, largely uh, red loam or, or clay soils, clods are a big issue with, with tine seeders. So when we're sowing a lot of crop early, we, uh, particularly dry sowing, we tend to generate a lot of clods, which compromises the establishment percentage. So we're sort of wanting to improve our crop establishment as well. So the disc seeders allow us to get away from clods. We've tried, uh, I guess, a coulter in front of a tine, but still not had the same success as what we get with a disc. Uh, in Western Australia, um, yeah, Peter said that they probably don't have that, that sort of issue on sandy soils with clods with dry sowing, but well, we certainly do on, on clay soils, and particularly when we get soils with sodicity. Um, as we're sort of wanting to dry sow, even though we're putting gypsum on and retaining stubble, dry sowing uh, sodic clay soils generates a lot of clods with a tine. And then, as I said, we've introduced the narrow rows, which is something a bit different in terms of the disc seeding, just to help with uh, extra yield. I'll talk about that. Weed competition, but also ground cover. So sort of ticking a few boxes all in, in the one space. So we've, we've sort of done a lot of work, and growers, to their credit, again, have, have helped in this space. So this is a, a disc seeder from... A, a, a grower in southern New South Wales, the Warakiri, it's an 18 metre uh, John Deere. So they're on a largely clay soil operation. So they've um, installed uh, hydraulic downforce on that unit to help maintain constant downforce in the presence of residue and also to, to counter their clay soils. So rather than just sort of, it, it is a bit of a problem with this seed, you have to put a lot of aftermarket stuff on it. And we've learned from the South Australians in that space, but it's really helped with their, with their crop establishment. So the first part of the sowing starts at harvest, so whether you're in a strip and disc system or not, if, you, if you've got a disc seeder, you really need to spread that residue, get an even, um, an even distribution across the back of the header. Penetration, and we've now got quite a few hydraulic units on not only John Deere's, but also XL machines, and it's just changed the game completely. So um, we've seen it in the US quite a bit, and now there's a manufacturer in Queensland building hydraulic downforce on, on disc units. Um, sharp discs, uh, seed firming wheels and having that ability to close the furrow. Particularly as you get later into the season but any disc seeding, you, any disc seeding that you see done poorly is, is often ten times worse than, than a tine seeder done, done well because it just really uh, compromises things like pre-emergent herbicides, um, I, I guess dry sowing so you, you leave that furrow open the, the seed establishment can be a lot worse than, uh, than even a sort of poor, poor tine job so you need to close the furrow. There can be some challenges, so there's a great example. Um, and the crop that probably gives us the most challenge in some of these scenarios is canola, like it just doesn't like, like cereal straw. So you've got to be really conscious of that. So there's been a lot of hair pinning in that photograph there, so um, a really poor establishment. So I guess it's, um, sorry, uh, it, it, the chaff can be quite toxic. So it causes a hair pinning. So hair pinning effectively is placing the seed on top of that stubble. So rather than sort of getting seeds or contact, um, you, you really need to be able to, to punch through that, that, that sort of standing stubble or, or stubble that's down. Um, 
we get what's called the winter blues with this seeding system, particularly in the first couple of years when you're in that transition phase. So the crop growth is really slow. You sort of see your neighbour next door with the parallelogram tine seed, the crops are at five leaf and tillering and powering away and your poor old disc crops look absolutely shit house and you're sort of wondering, well, what have we done? But it's just a, a transition phase and we've sort of meant to manage, we've learnt to manage some of those challenges with um, you know, reducing SU use, sort of zinc, um, zinc fertiliser early in the, in the program. Um, and even just early sowing, just getting crop growth um, up and away before that sort of winter period sets in. So that's, that's really helped. There's higher maintenance costs and time with a disc unit. Um, insect pressure is, is, is big and we heard um, Justin talk about that today, so we're seeing that as well. Um, but it's only with one crop. It's interesting, we always talk about all this um, yeah, pressure that we get from insects um, with, with disc systems and stubble retention, but it's usually with one crop and that's canola. So if, you, if you're aware of that and you set up your system, if you're, if you're a dedicated canola grower, um, you, you can sort of build a bit of resilience in that space, but it's, it's something that needs to be managed um, and, and not taken lightly. There's certainly less pre-em herbicide options, I'll, I'll grant you that. So that's, uh, and, and, and as Tim said, there's very few things registered. And generally, uh, we, we see a lot of interest from growers wanting to sort of move to a to a disc system for some of the reasons I've talked about, but they get talked out of it by their, their agronomist. So I'm not going to debate that here, but it's really, um, I guess it's a, it's a shift in thinking and, and confidence from growers. Like they've come through the no-till revolution, the knife point press wheel, it's a really well-established system. Um, but I, I'd sort of have the approach, and the growers teach me this all the time, is to innovate, don't deliberate. So just, just get on with it. And, and I think a key part of it is crop diversity. So Rick, Rick talked about it today. The, the ability to manage some of the challenges we see with disc seeders um, you know, through rotations and crop diversity opens up a whole lot of, uh, I guess, options we probably haven't had before. So this is the second time this graph's been up today, but yeah, great Tony Swan, he's a, a technical uh, agronomist with the CSIRO based out of Canberra. He did this work um, over three years, so looking at... Um, how that uh, high level, so they started with 1,800 plants per square metre of ryegrass, which they eventually got down to um, about 100 plants per square metre over three years using a range of rotation sequences. So the, um, the grey one was a diverse sequence, so that was uh, vetch, canola, wheat, barley. The, uh, the aggressive was canola, wheat, wheat, and that was Roundup Ready canola, Secura in the wheat phase. Uh, and then the conservative was just an OPTT canola and then wheat, wheat. So you can see the different types of rotations um, and then the influence that diversity can have on, on driving that rotation, on driving that ryegrass weed, weed seed bank down. So, um, and that was just using standard herbicide tactics. So there was no, 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 there was no row spacing influence and there was no harvest weed seed control in that as well, which Swanee um, but was sort of keen to sort of implement if he had, to, had the choice. So narrow row spacing, so there's a barley crop, um, planet barley, six and a half inch rows, sown into stripper stubble, um, Beckham wheat the year before on six and a half inch rows. So um, yeah, we're getting our 95% our established percentage using all the things I talked about with the, with the disc seeding. Um, I guess there are less pre-em herbicides and the whole industry is just very obsessed about using trifluralin for one reason or not. Um, interesting, did a presentation with Chris Preston earlier in the year at an agronomy update and he said you only need to use 800 mils of trifluralin to kill susceptible ryegrass. And here we are putting two and a half, three litres on. So it's obviously an inefficient, inefficient herbicide. So I, I just, it surprised me why it does get such uh, there's so much uh, passion around using the product when there's other tools out there, other herbicides, obviously uh, sometimes at high cost, but if we have things like the big six emphasise, we can take the pressure off something like trifluralin and hence we can use crop competition. So there's data that shows there's, um, there's higher yields. Um, Glenn Rothmother in WA says for every inch you go narrow, you can pick up 1% higher yield with your cereals. And that's over 29 years of research at Meriden. So rainfall Meriden... Growing season 300, so it's generally a dry area. So people say, well, that's, that sort of work's only been achieved in high rainfall zones, but it's, uh, yeah, it, that's, that's very um, strong data that, that can't be ignored. Uh, and, and work from some of the um, grower observations locally, we were seeing with, um, in the middle of February under some of these uh, narrow row spacings with the, with the strip of stubble, the air temperature was 42 degrees, uh, the bare soil was 52 degrees, and under the strip of straw was 32 degrees. And all that means is that that soil can recharge quicker. So we're getting water back into that because it's cooler. 
So if we get a five mil rain event, rather than it drying out because the soil is at 40 or 50 degrees, it retains that moisture because it's back down at 30 degrees. So that's, that's really important for us when we're trying to get crops up in, in April. And John Roster and Michael Walsh have proven this if we're trying to do harvest weed seed control. If we've got a competitive crop, ryegrass and brome particularly stand up because they're seeking out light. They'll stand in the upper canopy so they can be captured more uh, efficiently with harvest weed seed control. So that's, that's, yeah, that, that's quite an important point. So narrow rows, um, yeah, as I said, higher 1% more yield for every inch narrower. Uh, there's 29 years of data. CSU have done that work too with the, uh, uh, the, all the, they collated all the research trials and put it into one booklet if you're interested in reading. Um, Guy McMullen from the northern zone, so there's um, an extra, so there's a 6 to $16 a hectare loss um, per every centimetre increase in row spacing in the northern region. So we were at Emerald in a couple of weeks ago with a standard wheat row spacing up there is 50 centimetres. So they're, they're sort of cha challenged there in that environment to sort of look at changing some of their, uh, particularly in cereals, not so much in the chickpeas. Chris Preston, so that mess early sowing, pre-emerged herbicides, hybrid canola has the ability to reduce the seed set in ryegrass by 50%. So that's just not on a row spacing, that, that, that's just, just competitive crop type, like Chris talked about this morning. Michael Witterick, I find this really interesting, so it's some northern data, and, and one of the most challenging weeds we deal with in pulses is sow thistle. Um, so they were up with narrow rows, and they were just talking going back to 250 mil row spacings, they were able to reduce seed set in things like sow thistle and almost barnyard grass. So from my perspective, there's so much data, there's so many resistant weeds, it's just perhaps time for a change in thinking. So what's a stripper front? It's, as I said, it's a, a machine, uh, it's a header front made in the UK. Uh, you've got some um, rearward rotating rotor, so basically it's a, it's a, a header front that, that processes up to 85% of the grain in the front, rather than sort of putting it back through the header to process the grain. So it's just basically plucking the grains off the, off the heads. So you can actually see the, the gloom on the outside still sort of standing a lot of these um, yeah, stripper front grain, stripper front harvested crops. So there's really limited chaff through the header. Um, it's huge capacity, so it, you can sort of achieve 50 to 70 tonne an hour. Um, so that's a, a big a big bonus in terms of timeliness. So we've got some corporate farms we work with, so they currently uh, contract uh, four headers to, to do an area of sort of 12 to 14,000 hectares. So what it's meaning for them in the next couple of years, they've done some modelling, they, they can drop out, uh, take two headers back to one. So it might just mean instead of having uh, two headers and, uh, and one chaser bin, they potentially have one header and two chaser bins. So that's, that's a, a real time. And John Francis from Home Sackett's actually modelled some of that. Less fuel, so it's 50% less per hectare or per tonne. Uh, high harvest, so we've got less, less cost in that space, less head aware and less R&M. And again, this has been quantified by an economist. Um, it reduces the need for, for a MAV or a power cast uh, and the fuel consumption that, that can sort of draw. And we're left with tall stubble. So um, it's really interesting, again, being in the northern region in recent weeks. So when we do our water use efficiency calculations, we sort of tend to put in 25 to 30% of that fallow efficiency on a French and Schultz. Uh, and some modelling done by, um, I guess, people like Northern Grower Alliance and Rob Long. So they're really looking to lift that fallow efficiency through some of their stripper front work in the north by 30, uh, even up to 40. So if they can lift that by 20 to 30 per cent, the extra water that makes available for them for later in the crop um, is very significant. So, so some real numbers can come out of that. And we're, we're also seeing with Michael Walsh, uh, his data is saying that things like brome grass can be plucked by the stripper front compared to a draper which lays it over. So that's, um, yeah, that's some work that has now been quantified. So, uh, yeah, this is a case study you've probably seen before. Six and a half tonne wheat barley crop in, uh, in 2016. Seems like a thousand years ago now compared to some of the crops we've got this year. But um, draper front, good numbers, 35 tonne an hour, 100% engine power, put the stripper on, effectively doubled it. Um, with a lot of modifications to the header, header, mind you, and then engine power dropped down to uh, 60 to 70 percent. So that's just some sheer uh, efficiency. So there are some challenges, like everything in agriculture. We think it's all beer and skittles, but there, there is some significant challenges. Um, grain loss is a challenge, particularly with different varieties. So we can see you change from one wheat variety or one barley variety to another. And, and I must stipulate that the stripper front is only used in, in cereals. Um, we've tried a little bit of in lentils and even in standing canola with n not a lot of success. But there can be losses through the front and also losses through the rotor. 
um, which has created a few tro troubles with mice, as we know. Setup is critical, so there's quite a few changes that need to be made. Uh, and again, growers have been innovating in this uh, in this area. So um, yeah, the John Deere's, believe it or not. Um, uh, are quite easy to, to make modifications to the concave, whereas the, uh, the, the case takes a bit more, a bit more effort. Um, keeping grain away, we've had troubles with this, so we've put a stripper front on the front of a class 8 header and, and the headers had to be stopped because they just can't keep it away once they start to get past 50, 60 tonne an hour. So that's, that's self-defeating, there's just no point really. Uh, and, and if you have a contractor that comes to your place that you want to you know, potentially use a stripper front, um, yeah, it's, it's a pretty big ask for them to uh, to sort of invest capital in something that might actually make them uh, that much more money. Performance can vary with the season and the type of header. So the sieve capacity, for example, in New Holland is already pretty good. Um, and no offence to the John Deere, but the, yeah, the, if you put a, a stripper front on them, the, the, the capacity grows up significantly. So um, there's observations that have come from people who have played around with these before. Probably the big one we found, uh, and people like Barry Haskins who have had stripper fronts in the, um, the western area of New South Wales for quite a few years, that this, their system fell over. So they had stripper fronts, they were on uh, 33 to third row spacing, so they just could, a third of a metre, just couldn't get it to work. So what was happening is the, um, the, the losses, because when we find we're on a narrow row spacing, you keep a constant feed against that drum as, as the... The stripper front's going through the crop, but once you get out onto wide row spacing, the heads can droop down and we can't pick it up as effectively. So, um, and then they also ran into trouble with, uh, with, with ryegrass on that same stripper stuff, stubble system. So they, they actually went away from it, but when we've been um, yeah, reintroducing it back into to sort of more recent systems, all our row spacings have been less than, than that 250 mil or that 10 inch, and it's worked a lot better. And also there's a the cost of an extra front, so there's another 100 grand in capital sitting there with, a, uh, with, with a, another front in the shed. So that's, that's something significant. So we've got a, a couple of growers who syndicate their uh, draper fronts and then they own their own stripper fronts. So that's sort of uh, a way of, of for smaller operators that they've, to, they use the, the draper front goes on for wind rowing and, um, and some of the pulses and then it's, it's syndicated. So a couple of examples, I don't just make all this stuff up, there's some really motivated growers that have uh, inspired us to, to work in this, and we've worked with them to get the, the systems to sort of match the, uh, the ideals that they've been working towards. Ben Beck is, um, is a photo with Pete a couple of years ago, so he was disseeding since about 2010, had a stripper system since about 2015, and for him the ground cover drives the system, so he's had narrow rows, seven and a half inch rows, he's, he's sort of been on 15 and then sort of come narrower. Uh, and the ability to have diverse rotations is, uh, he lives in a, a very frosty zone, so he's just not far from Wagga, so up to uh, two thirds of his farm is very subjected to frost, but it's given him the ability with that ground cover to be able to put crops like long season canola uh, or vetch and other um, diverse crop tools that he didn't have in the past because he's now got this moisture retained um, from, from primarily the disc, but also the stripper system as well. Um, David and Jenny Thompson, they're a really interesting couple, so they modified an old flexi core. They've got boss units running at seven and a half inch. Um, uh, they're mixed farmers, so they run, run sheep as well. Uh, I've got the chaff line photograph there as well, so the sheep graze the chaff lines. Um, they've been running a stripper front for a couple of years now as well. Again, they're in a very frosty zone, so livestock, farm zoning and a, and a diverse range of enterprises are really important for them. But the same thing is constant for them. They want to have moisture available in March and April so they can sow crops, get them up, get them grazed, get them out of that, uh, that sort of, um, I guess, period when they struggle to get crops up and start to get dry in, in April with the, with the standard system. So mixed farmers are making it work as well. So continuous croppers have come up with the ideas and now the mixed farmers are, are adapting it to, to their system. And then Brendan, John and, Pat Brendan and John Patterson. Uh, Brendan is, uh, they've been disseeding for over 12 years. They've been running a Shelbourne for, for three years. Um, again, standard sort of 10.5 metre CTF, uh, 8 inch row spacings. A big one for them is just the change in their soils over that 12 years. Um, and Pete's done some numbers on this and looking at their water use efficiency numbers in reverse. So seeing what they actually achieved at harvest. And as I said before, we took about 25 or 30% fallow efficiency. So now they're getting to a point where they don't ever even sort of consider any, any um, evaporation. So they're using their water from the summer and the winter to grow a crop. And that's just for a long-term change in soil structure. Um, the ability to retain, and it's, it's hard to believe when you're sort of seeing someone up here, but you look at the level of residue they're sowing that crop into, really tall standing straw, not a lot of chaff, 
um, and Kirillou was out there the day that, that got sown. That's just gone back into barley. Um, so two years of cereal, then they'll be back into a double break, favour bean, canola, but it, it is achievable. But the, the level of moisture they can retain um, year in, year out, even when things get dry, is quite, is quite remarkable. So to quote Aristotle in 330 BC, I, I guess it's the whole is greater than some of its parts. Um, it, it's, it's not just one single component. It's not just a stripper front. It's not just a disc seeder. It's everything put together. So we're seeing some emerging agronomy come out of this um, as companion cropping, so something a little bit different that um, Tim had a photograph. So we've got growers been doing this for a couple of years for, a soil, for soil reasons, for um, nitrogen cycling reasons. So they're adding companions in with their, uh, with their standard crops and then terminating those companions. So that's a whole other talk in itself. But the reason they're able to do that is they've got moisture uh, for early sowing. So that's, that's a key, key thing. The moisture is just retained for longer. Um, we're sort of opening up opportunities with things like safflower. Uh, the foxes also grew some spring sown chickpeas last year, which yielded the same as our autumn sown chickpeas, despite being a decile one. Um, we've got a lot of confidence around long season crops, such as winter canola and winter wheat. And as I said, the companion crops for soils and water. So we're thinking, why aren't these companion crops using the water as a weed would? Um, but they are a companion, so they're a beneficial. Uh, and as we know, things like lentils and peas don't use a lot of water anyway. So if we can fix a little bit of nitrogen, not so much for this year, but residual for, for the, the season afterwards, it can only help with, uh, with cycling. Um, so ultimately, it's about improving that water use efficiency, that kilograms per millimetre. So we can't just keep whinging about it doesn't rain, it's too dry. When are we going to have an average season? I guess the point I'm making is these growers are sort of just getting on with the job, looking at all the tools that are out there and adapting some of these things to, to, to their system. So the take-home messages, I guess look at the whole system to achieve the greatest benefit, so not just the, the single components of it. Um, the emerging agronomy is, is quite exciting, so there's a shift in, in some of the thinking and the practices they can pull in, such as the, the companion crops. And innovation is not without its challenges, as we know. So there's been a few, um, yeah, a few tough times with, with, through this process. And, and the best thing about these growers, like today with the, with the panel, they're all really happy to share the good things and, and the bad things. So um, that, that's sort of something that I, I take inspiration from. And I just I constantly amaze. It's a lot of this stuff. There's never any GRDC funding or other price, formal processes. They just sort of hook in and, and get it done and work it out for themselves through their own network. So I, I always take my hat off to the growers and really privileged to be able to hang around them to, uh, to work this stuff out. So. And uh, yeah, thank you and, and keep sharing. <laughs>